まもなく1時となりますので認知症 It's almost time to start the next session on dementia prevention and care care to be provided at appropriate time まもなく開始となりますが、この会議は同時通訳にて進行いたします。通訳レシーバーは机の上にご用意しております。同時通訳レシーバーは、日本語はチャンネル1、英語はチャンネル2をご選択ください。ただいまよりセッション1 We now start session one on prevention and care of dementia appropriate support to be provided at appropriate timing. The chair of this session is Dr. Kazuo Hasegawa from Tokyo Dementia Care Research and Training Center and Dr. Eve Janet in, from Institute of Aging, CIHR and the University of Montreal, Canada. Uh, we will continue with this session until uh, 3 o'clock, and I hope that the speaker stick to the time uh, given. Gentlemen, I'm Kazuo Hasegawa, uh, Director of Tokyo, Honorary Director of Tokyo Dementia Research and Education Center. I would like to chair the session with uh, Dr. and Professor Eves Joannet, University of Montreal, Canada. Let's talk, discuss, and talk, discuss, and reconsider from many points of view about new cases, new care, and prevention models of dementia. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Asekawa. It's a pleasure to uh, be, uh, have the opportunity to co-chair this important uh, session where we will look at uh, timely and appropriate support for dementia. And I see already uh, in the title some points of discussion of how timely and appropriate things should be. But let's start with each of the uh, speakers who will have 10 minutes to be invited. And the first speaker is Hara Yasu Yamaguchi from the Gunma University here in Japan. And uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. My talk today is on the early detection of dementia and initial phase intensive support team of the Orange Plan. The Japanese CAT is now doing weight training. Is she preventing dementia? No. Cat usually die before developing dementia. Her life is too short. On the contrary, human lives longer and develop dementia. So exercise is necessary to prevent dementia, but exercise prolongs life and thus enhances occurrence of dementia. Prevention is not is to postpone, but not to get off the risk. Prevention may not decrease number of demented patients. Also, age of onset will be delayed. What the early detection? This shows, slide shows whole processes of Alzheimer's disease for 40 years. The earliest detection is 15 years before the onset of dementia by amyloid imaging. CSF tau or cerebral blood flow measured by SPECT scan detect 80 changes at the MCI stage. But Early detection in my talk today means at the onset of dementia. As already known, early detection has both advantage and disadvantage. For example, institutionalized care may be delayed as advantage, but shortage of social resources may occur as disadvantage. For the early detection, we developed the questionnaire SED11Q. First question, ask the same things repeatedly is the most common sign of dementia. If the caregiver checked more than three items, yes, dementia is suspected. The SED11Q is also useful to prevent anosognosia, that is, decreased self-awareness. The patient awareness, the same 11 questions, answer the same 11 questions right hand. In a representative case, caregiver checked seven, but the patient checks only two. Larger discrepancy mean more severe anosognosia. This graph shows discrepancy between patient and caregivers. In moderate AD dementia, caregiver checked nine, but the patient aware only one or two items. Caregiver tend to give attention to patient and warn the patient, but the patient do not notice their mistakes. The discrepancy causes BPSD, wild words, or violence. So we ask caregiver, be sure not to notice the failure, because demented person cannot aware of own mistakes. This is a caregiver education using the questionnaire. Patient awareness decreases according to the disease progression, but the, this makes patient feel happy. That can be a gift for the patient. This is another way of patient-friendly detection of dementia, the Yamaguchi Fox Pigeon Imitation Test. First, show a sign of a fox. Most subjects can imitate the fox sign. Then, show the sign of a pigeon. And say, watch my hand gesture carefully and imitate it. Wait 10 seconds and judge. That's it. 70 of demented subjects failed to imitate the pigeon sign. And Alzheimer's patients tend to put their palms outside as three-year child does. <clears throat> Why Alzheimer patients show opposite side of hands? This is because patient function of converting the perspective from other to mine is damaged in the early stage of AD. This function develops in four to five years old children. So both three years child and Alzheimer patients show the same pattern palms outside. This imitation test takes only 30 seconds and detects 70% of demented subjects and patient-friendly. 
percent failed in mild dementia CDR1 and 80% failed in moderate dementia CDR2. Furthermore, this failure indicates that Alzheimer patients cannot evaluate their behavior objectively from the third person viewpoint, resulted in difficulties in self awareness of illness. He looks depressed. He was just now given the diagnosis of dementia. He said, Early diagnosis is early despair. Early diagnosis should be associated with early support to reduce psychological damage of anxiety and depression. Therefore, the Japanese government started the initial phase intensive support team, IPIST, task in the orange plan. The target are persons without proper diagnosis, medical or welfare service and that with severe BPSD. The team members are healthcare staff, including public health nurse, occupational therapists, and social workers. I'm a team doctor of the IPIST in the Maiva city. The operation is as follows. The first, the team received a request through 11 community general support centers. Second, the team get medical information from the primary doctor of the subject. Third, the team staff visit and evaluate the cognitive function, medical status, ADL, VPSD, condition of caregiver, and their needs. Fourth, support plan is discussed in a team staff meeting. Fifth, the team arranged for diagnosis and medical and welfare service. Sixth, is a second assessment and the sharing of information among concerned organizations. Seventh, is a follow-up. Care, caregiver education is quite important to prevent BPSD. We prepared a guidebook for family care. This shows IPISD subject in my city in past one year. We have visited 58 persons, 2.5 times per person. First visit took nearly two hours. 51 person was suspected to be demented, three to be psychiatric, five to be alcoholic. In eight, main problem was in the caregiver side, neglect and refusal of help. Most were not diagnosed as having dementia. Severity of dementia was mild in about 70% of cases. We analyzed the effect quantitatively. Dementia severity did not change significantly. BPSD evaluated by DVD scale 13 item version tend to improve from 15.4 to 11.6, but not significant. Care burden evaluated by ZARIT-8 decreased significantly from 20.4 to 18.6 after the intervention. As a result, 38% of the subject newly connected to medical treatment, together with the subject connected already, more than 80% of subject connected to the medical treatment. On the other hand, 30% of subject newly connected to welfare service. Demented subject tend to refuse care service. This is a summary of all Japan IPISD Act for six months in 2013 fiscal year. Total 636 subjects were con concerned in 14 cities in Japan. About 50% of subjects have difficulties in support due to BPSD, refusal, neglect, and alcohol. Mean number of visits per person was 3.1. First visit took 77 minutes. Team staff meeting was held weekly, taking 90 minutes. This year, the IPSD Act is now going on in 108 cities in Japan. This is a take-home message. Questionnaire SAD11Q and the Yamaguchi Fox Vision Imitation Test contribute to the early detection of dementia as a screening. Furthermore, SED11Q evaluate anosognosia that is difficulty in self-awareness of being demented and is useful to prevent BPSD through caregiver education. As an early support system, initial phase intensive support team in the orange plan con connect demented subjects to medical and social support to decrease care burden and to prevent BPSD. 
We hope the subject continue to live at home with dignity. Thank you for your attention. My 10 minutes has gone. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Yamaguchi, and thanks for respecting the time. Um, after each presentation, we can uh, welcome one or two questions of clarification if needed. So if there's a question of clarification at this point, um, if not, we will have the discussion after all the speakers. Yes, uh, uh, one question of clarification here, and I will ask uh, the microphone to be f flown to you. <laughs> uh, yep, like a pigeon. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm curious about the financial evaluation. There's a very intensive effort on the part of some high-class professionals uh, in 636 cases. Uh, and you've seen a delayed in institutionalization, uh, but is there a financial analysis of the cost and benefit of this effort? And the cost is not already uh, analyzed yet. Thank you, and we'll be we'll be back with more uh, discussion. And thanks for the for the question. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Jiro Okochi. He's from the Japan Association of Geriatric Health Services Facility here. And uh, Dr. Okochi will talk about the effectiveness of rehabilitation and health promotion activities. Please. Thank you, Dr. Hasega. Thank you, Dr. Janet. Um, today, I'll be talking about two recent successful service at Japanese intermediate uh, facility, which is called Roken in Japanese. There are about 4,000 Roken facilities in Japan, which is about two Roken in each municipalities. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. Um, wide range of services, including health promotion, primary care, secondary care, rehabilitation, terminal care, uh, provided, pro, uh, provided in Roken facilities. But most importantly, Roken facilities uh, provide service for elderly persons in transition of care. Roken can be characterized by its aim to help enable them to return home and maintain their uh, life at home. For this purpose, we, produce, uh, we provide care with multidisciplinary uh, cooperation. We also provide day rehabilitation and services for elderly persons living in the community. So service provided at Roken facilities matches the WHO definition of integrated care. Today, I would like to introduce two services. Uh, about five years ago, specialists at Roken started to provide these services to customers. One is today's main topic, intensive rehabilitation for elderly dementia patients staying at Roken facilities. Second one is health promotion activities called Kaigo Yobo Salon. I'll touch on this quickly from the next slides before going into into about the intensive rehabilitation. It's called Kaigo Yobo Salon, but it's called Salon, but it's not referring to a room. There are people who experience minor functional or cognitive impairments, but not eligible for public nursing care insurance services. This service provides various health promotional activities for those people living in the community. Roken facility provides space for the activities. Participants take initiatives in deciding what kind of activity they want to do in a group discussion. Staffs and therapists provide help as needed. This is an example of one of these act those activities. This person makes his original, his original New Year greeting cards with an instruction from facility staffs. It is an effective health promoting activity using existing hardware and human resources. This may seem small, but it is an effective measure to prevent functional or cognitive deterioration, which leads to hospitalization and uh, institutionalization. Now I'll talk about intensive rehabilitation for dementia patients, which is my main topic today. 
The intensive rehabilitation for dementia patients was carried out in a tailor-made manner to meet individual needs. This means each therapist designed a program for each patient according to his or her past history and activity of their preference. This is the example of a rehabilitation program, learning session, training with memory card, music therapy, music therapy or handicraft sessions. Each patient participating in this program attends the rehabilitation session three times a week for three months. On comparison of the um, intervention group and control group, this rehabilitation program showed improvement in short-term memory. The, on the, this is the interve oh, intervention group. Uh, short-term memory, activity of daily living, depression, and behavior disturbance. Moreover, the length of stay in the facility was shortened by the average of 70 days for those received to cognitive rehabilitation. Uh, the detail of intensive cognitive rehabilitation is also shown at the poster session, and I'm pleased to produce mo uh, more detailed information at the poster. As a result of multidisciplinary cooperative care at the facility, including the rehabilitation program, function of the elderly person improved during the stay. Roken Association constructed the ICF staging, which consists of 15 items using WHO's ICF codes. Um, using these 15 items, we, uh, we constructed five summary scales which are mobility ADL, eating, self-care, cognition, behavior, and participation. And we have measured the change in function of these five domains uh, uh, during the facility stay and after, uh, after when they go back to home. The patient stay at Roken is indicated in orange arrows. The mobility ADL, mobility and ADL, eating, self-care, cognitive function, problem behavior, social participation, all improved during our, our, faci during our facility state. This functional change can be con considered as a direct effect of our care and rehabilitation. The green period indicates the period one week after discharge to a month after discharge. What we see here is gradual deterioration of function in, of mobility, self-care, and cognitive function. So th these patients require continuous care. However, the social participation shows a different pattern. It continues to improve. This suggests the quality of life has improved after discharge to home. As a conclusion, I would like to emphasize that multidisciplinary integrated care provided at Roken contributes to QOL in improvement of dementia patients. It, en it en enables elderly with disabilities to return and live at home. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rokochi. Uh, we do have time for some clarification. Um, maybe as an anticipation of uh, George Radenberg's question, uh, who is uh, in charge of supporting the Roken Centers? Is, is this the Ministry of Health? Is it uh, community-based? So who, who's paying uh, financially? Uh, this is, uh, uh, it is basically paid by the public's uh, long-term care insurance. So it's, it's supported by the uh, uh, premium of the citizens. And. Um, I'm sorry, I probably missed the information uh, as you were uh, explaining it, but the Roken uh, house is a place where people stay for a certain yeah, time. Well, this is, they're, they're not staying at home, and then it's not uh, a daycare center. We have both. We have uh, a facility to, for the patient to stay, okay. and it's, which is average for about 80 beds for each facility, yes. and there's also about 20 to 30 days rehabilitation spaces. And did you see any differences in your result or measure between those who were staying versus those who were like in daycare, or is the tendency oh, similar? The, the, the result of a measurement. 
itself. It, um, could you give me the slides back? To can I have the, my slides back? Because I we can show some. Could you please um, go back to my slide? Yeah. Could you please operate my presentation material? Effect as well. If we, we measure the same thing. Okay. And and in some scales, it seems the those measure at home looks worse. But it can be environmental effect, not only measure the, the effect of measurement. And you can, my, uh, uh, the second slide from the uh, end, could you please go back to my slide, please? Hmm? Well, so uh, we, we have tested that okay. and showed, shown some difference, but we okay. couldn't distinguish whether it was measurement effect or environmental effect. We can clear that up. And, and sorry for a last question, because it's simply a question of enthusiasm by yes, reference sure. to your... Uh, w w w and, uh, you know, in comparing treated and non-treating group, it's always the question of yes. how comparable uh -huh. they are, and, yes. and was there a bias why and they our, were treated or untreated? Um, it is shown at poster session, and we, we can provide you more okay. detail. And there is no ba big difference. Okay. There are some difference, but it's, I, it, I, I thought it's minor. Okay, thank you. Uh, one thank question you. here, last uh, one, because we... Uh, if, can we have a uh, microphone here? Because um, the session is stream video, so we have to... It's, it's coming. Please, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Natalie Turner from AARP in the US. Um, I hate to sound like the audience is obsessed by money, but um, have you been able to translate the reduction in the um, period of stay and the, the reduction in cognitive, physical, and functional design into um, uh, performance into fundings, in savings, financial savings elsewhere in the system? Is it cost effective? Well, looking at least at the... Just a moment. But this slide, which is uh, the facility stay is shortened about 70 days if we provide this rehabilitation service. But uh, sorry to say, this, is, this study comes from a single site, which means the case management, not only rehabilitation, but also case management of patients to, to bring them back home is probably as important as rehabilitation. But this, of course, if the uh, facility stays shortened, it's a reduction of big money. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll, have, we'll come back for some other uh, questions later on. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Dr. Okuchi. And now we will welcome Dr. Manabu Ikeda from the uh, Kumamoto University here in Japan. Uh, please, um, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I'm honored to have the opportunity to give my talk in this meeting. And today, I would like to talk about our uh, medical uh, dementia network in the community based for dementia. Because of the time limitation today, I'd like to give my talk in relatively fluent Japanese. This is Kumamoto Prefecture, as you see. The population is 1.8 million. Here is our network covering area. Kumamoto Prefecture, a very boasting long longevity, men and women, compared to the average Japan. It's number four in Japan. And, and there are 100,000 people with dementia. Uh, this is the latest uh, dementia statistics. This is Japan total, 4.62 million MCI, 4 million, 8 million people together will be suffering from dementia. And there are eight locations in Japan where we surveyed this epidemiology and it also includes the Kumamoto University data. This is the Japan total data. What about the specialists for dementia? Uh, this is 
Japan, and there are two societies, Japanese Psycho Jury Ethics Society and Japan Society for Dementia Research. Both are the specialists for dementia, uh, but total only 2,300 specialists nationwide. And there are many overlapping areas. I myself belong to both societies, so probably overall less than 2,000 specialists. That is to say, this is specialists for dementia versus patients with dementia, the ratio. This is one dementia specialist. He or she will have to cover at least 2,000 patients with dementia, and in reality, they must be covering 4,000 demented patients. So uh, that is why we need to establish a system for the professionals and specialists for dementia. All in all, this shows the challenge from 2008. Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare is focusing on establishing the focus areas for dementia treatment, and these are the medical centers. They will be in charge of the early diagnosis and also the plans for the medicine and nursing care, and also the treatment for BPSD, and also the management of concomitant physical symptoms. And this is the regional cooperation, the network, which I'm going to elaborate today. Having said that, this is Kumamoto Prefecture, and we are at the University Hospital, and this is the psychiatry. That is where the center is located. That is why six and seven are newly added goals for us. Number six is, of course, a university is to educate. That is why to foster manpower, not just the doctors, but all the other healthcare providers we would like to train. And number seven, Kumamoto Berkshire as a whole, we want to have the even and the equal provision of medical care for dementia. And this is a so-called Kumamoto model. That the system that we are proud of. And this is the University Hospital. That is where the core center is located. There, the core center is in charge of fostering manpower and also devising various educational programs. And then we have the community-based centers, which are the backup centers. So there are two divisions of labor, as you see here. Uh, this is the core center versus the community-based center, and the community-based centers are at the forefront of receiving and dealing with the dementic patients. And this is the core center, only one core center, which is us, and there are several community-based centers around us. This is the more detailed view. We want to have the even or equal provision of the services. In Kumamoto Prefecture, most of the patients drive a car. So within 30 minutes of driving, they want to have the access to the specialty hospitals. Uh, this is the uh, data two years ago. Uh, this is during a one-week period, 800 patients who visited the hospitals. And this is the commuting hours or commuting minutes. All in all, this is evenly distributed, and people can have the quick access within 30 minutes. And that's the core center that is us, the Guma Kumamoto University. And the 22 minutes is the average commuting time before reaching the hospital. This is the results of the specialty medical care for dementia. This is 2013. And this is the consultation, including the visits, and also the new outpatients, 200, and also total outpatients, including the revisits, the total of 4,200. So 4,000 patients are being covered by four centers per month. If it is 100,000 patients, it is only 4%. And so the BPSD and the physical con mobility and the initial consultation. And so uh, these are some of the cycles of the uh, visits. And probably this is about the ratio. Uh, this is from the core center that is the university hospital. And to the community-based uh, centers, we dispatch specialists. And once a week, we have eight centers which we dispatch our specialists. And that's where they are in charge of specialty dementia outpatient clinic. and. 
uh, well, that the three are the full-time specialists, and the other way around is that one. From the community-based center to core center, that is a SPECT scan where the M RI, the early diagnosis, is done at the university hospital. And also the early onset, young onset patients will also be referred to core center. And also the safety assessment for patients who live alone and the admission for testing core center. And also the serious comorbidities are also being treated at the core center. Uh, this is the five-year period. And once a year, we get together for the case conference where all the five university hospital and the hospitals uh, representatives get together. And also, we had the 33 of such meetings. And every time I participate, and uh, for the two months period, uh, they get together to present the three. It's difficult to deal with the case re reports at the meeting. And there are many shortages of the GPs as well. So these are the how these uh, specialists are fostered. 425 GPs and 141 GPs have gone through the original program who have gone through the dementia training programs. And once they have gone through the programs, and the governor of Komodo Prefecture will give them the certificates to prove that the G GPs are the specialists, and these information are also publicized on the web. And also, there are dementia support doctors as well, and they will also be given the network trainings and then after going through that sort of a support doctor course, they will also be entitled with the certificates by the governor. And before the system, there are only 22, but the number increased. And we have the most number of dementia support doctors per capita. And these are doctors who have gone through the programs. And then they will also serve as a commentators in the case study meetings. This is an example of the case conferences prepared by the community-based centers. A 30 to 40 of such case study meetings are being held every year. And these are the most difficult to deal with the patients whose cases are presented. And these are the, all the healthcare providers who participate, not just the doctors, as you see here. And this is the last slide. And we have the core center, uh, which is responsible for the outreach. This is uh, the people who live alone before discharge from the hospital. Uh, there are multidisciplinary visiting teams who visit the patient. And this is Levy body dementia patient. Ten days before the discharge, occupational therapist and the nurse visited together with the patient to see how home living would be. She is living alone in Kumamoto City. Uh, the professionals are checking the bath, and this is a uh, levy body dementia, and she cannot walk, but there are rails, and uh, another rail was to be put using the nursing care insurance. And then that sort of uh, the step was purchased by the care provider. She's still living happily alone. And uh, three years have passed since then. But she's living alone happily in the community. And this is a very nice slide that I have prepared. This is a summary of what I have mentioned. Uh, there are two tiers that was in the past, but currently what Kumamoto Prefecture is dealing with is a three-tier system, including the GP care staffs and the dementia supporters. So this is a three-layer uh, support system. And in each region, there are unique resources that are utilized. So if the nursing care is the focus, nursing care support systems, and there are other areas where the care staffs are taking the lead and the other areas where GPs are taking the lead. So we would like to maximize the efficiency, cost efficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rikeva. Uh, we have time for really uh, one question of clarification. We please wait for the microphone here. And thanks for uh, identifying yourself. Hi, Mike Splane. 
Um, I'm curiously attracted to the bear, but my real question is, um, if I break a hip and I am a person with dementia, mm -hmm. who takes care of me? Pardon? If, I, if I'm a person with dementia yes. and I break my hip, yes. where do I go? It's a network. And uh, who's in charge? Yes. Uh, if you live alone, maybe the care manager or uh, uh, GP uh, uh, access our medical center, community-based center. And uh, the operation is very hard. The community education center access our core center, and uh, you can receive the operation in the university hospital. That's the flow. And how dementia-friendly is that uh, hip fix? Pardon? How, who is in charge of who, making sure that people are thinking about the person with the problems with thinking oh. while they're in the hospital? So. Uh, now we can uh, build, in, we, we try to build up such a network, early detection in dementia uh, patient, uh, like a MCI level. And uh, uh, periodically, the, some uh, manager uh, search, uh, check their health, health. Thank you, and, and we'll come back to these uh, discussion because I think we heard three, thank you so much. Thank you very uh, much. Dr. Ikeda, because we heard three uh, very enlightening presentation on, on the model. We'll come back and let's hear from other models and the next one will be from UK. And I will invite Charles Alessi from the Public Health England to share with us on this topic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about a somewhat different subject to what was discussed this morning for the people who are here. This morning we're talking about um, uh, uh, risk reduction in dementia. I'm now going to talk about how dementia is managed in England at the moment. Um, uh, clearly we have arrows. The mouse. Oh, it's the mouse. Oh, I see. Left click. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have some advantage in England because, of course, we have a, um, a, a single publicly funded uh, health system uh, set to be one of the largest in the world. But in essence, what that means is that we have a unified information system. And that in itself with a, uni with a single identifier, which is the NHS number. And that is particularly helpful because it enables us to actually manage healthcare in a slightly different way, as um, I will describe. Um, and we also are, st are trying to integrate adult social care much more with our health system, uh, as well as having a public health system, of course, which is um, organized in an arm's length body. Um, I'm not going to bore you with um, um, the overview of the system uh, in England, because even though it is deemed to be simple by international standards, it's still fiendishly complicated, uh, like it is everywhere else in the world. Uh, but actually, it's not quite as complex as it looks. In essence, uh, groups of general practitioners called clinical commissioning groups manage the majority of care on a sectoral basis, and the sectors are based around local government, local authorities, and then there's a national body associated with that. Um, we talked this morning about the size of the challenge. Uh, we all know what the size of that challenge is, and I don't really wish to talk about that again. But I think uh, what we really need to talk about today is uh, not the risk reduction, which we talked about earlier, but the efforts we're making at um, early identification, because uh, we do have uh, the same sorts of problems around underdiagnosis that um, uh, exist everywhere else. So there's an awful lot of work going on around um, getting primary care to understand their populations better. We have introduced a calculator, yes, another calculator, which we have, which we have given general practitioners to be able to predict the numbers of people on their lists um, who potentially have dementia, and for them to investigate the deficit between the people they think have dementia and the people who probably do have dementia. Uh, so that in itself is a spur for people to look for the undiagnosed. That has pr proved to be sig a, a real significant step. Uh, we're also uh, concentrating on case finding, looking at the higher risk populations on primary care lists and doing work around that. 
Um, <clears throat> we've set up a whole network of memory clinics uh, which have increased in activity really quite dramatically over the last few years. These are specialist centers, uh, specialist centers for the more difficult diagnosis and also bringing together all the different disciplines in one place to assist people both with diagnosis and also with uh, care management. <clears throat> But we do still have a problem. Um, at the moment, um, over half of the people with dementia receive a diagnosis, and uh, we feel that we need to set ourselves a national ambition, which is that two-thirds of people with dementia uh, will receive a diagnosis, and the ambition really is for that to be achieved by March of next year. So we, we don't have very much time uh, to do that. But it's very clear that um, a timely assessment and timely diagnosis is uh, what it's about, because people are still being diagnosed too late, people are still not getting the care that they need to, even though we've made really quite significant strides to try to um, uh, uh, ameliorate that situation. Uh, in terms of, in terms of um, how we're managing that process, as you see from the map, we've mapped out the variation uh, of, um, of, of uh, diagnosis rates in different parts of the country. And what we're doing is actually actively going into the areas of the country where people are not actually diagnosing at the rate one would expect to try to find out why. And very often, the reasons why are really quite simple. Um, um, uh, di uh, dementia has slipped off the top um, uh, most important list of things which people are dealing with. Relationships are very often uh, not quite as developed as they could be. Medical leadership uh, can be um, uh, uh, not as robust as it could be. The usual things you have in your countries. This is very common to everybody else. In terms of other things we're doing, we, ha we have um, uh, um, learned a lot from our Japanese colleagues, and uh, I'm wearing the lapel of the Dementia Friends, which we copied from you, in essence. Um, and we've started this, this, this uh, campaign to really get people to appreciate um, uh, what dementia is about, to try to have a whole cadre of people to assist um, individuals with dementia. We've signed up um, half a million people uh, on this program to date, which is a, a pretty notable achievement. And we're using all sorts of media savvy ways in which to um, um, uh, address uh, populations. We're also talking much more about dementia-friendly communities, dementia-friendly cities, to try to get the concept of dementia far more understood in as many places as possible. Because even though we don't have um, the, uh, uh, the numbers of people which Japan faces in terms of percentage of population, uh, we're not that far behind, and we really need to prepare ourselves for a, a situation where many more of us uh, will be in this uh, uh, place where we have to manage a significant number of people with dementia. <clears throat> We're also doing a lot of work around equity, especially multiculturalism associated with it, different ethnic groups having less or more difficulty in accessing care and diagnosis, and this is directly from NHS England, uh, quite significant pieces of work, but again, given the scale of, of, of the multi-ethnicity that exists uh, in England, uh, the challenge here is really quite significant. Even though uh, the advances that have been made, uh, particularly with uh, minority uh, populations, uh, has, been, has been really quite noteworthy in a short time. But I wouldn't like to give the impression that this is completed work. This is work which has started, uh, and work which I think is, um, um, is about a third complete so I think we're, we're actually quite far along a path because a few years ago we, haven't been, you know, we weren't doing this systematically. And finally, we're doing work around support for carers, um, <clears throat> really getting people to understand the importance of life stories. Uh, we've evaluated uh, uh, um, uh, our work on dementia advisors and uh, we're publishing more and more uh, documentation around guides and around various other uh, areas of interest. Uh, finally, we're doing some uh, um, uh, new initiatives around collecting our information and knowledge because even though there is a significant amount of information being collected in England, um, in many respects it's not being collected and collated in a single space. And so we have set up a dementia intelligence network to really try to collate all the different areas of intelligence and research that are taking place in one single locus to ensure that at least we don't... Um, a, replicate the work we're doing, and B, ensure that, if possible, we, we, we don't ignore places 
uh, of interest and uh, places where we're not really delivering services and try to address it comprehensively. Um, <clears throat> so the work on dementia is ongoing. It is a highly difficult and complex area. The levels of stigma attached to dementia worldwide are still there. And in England, they're there like they are everywhere else. Um, I think this is an area where we're starting to understand and learn from the messaging that we're giving to populations uh, by the day and by the week. We still haven't really honed those skills effectively enough yet. And I think the next few years are the time when we're really going to get to the place we need to, where we will have the respect for people that we need to engender, both in terms of the people with dementia and also for the carers of people who are caring for people with dementia, because it's still not considered to be as much of a um, priority as perhaps it should be. Um, so um, I'm hoping that uh, 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 meetings like this will carry through um, uh, to your countries as well as to England for us to uh, really reinvigorate um, the work we're doing around dementia, uh, because I think we can do it if we actually act somewhat more collegiately than we've been doing in the past. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, any question of clarification? Pierluigi Nicotera from Germany. We just wait for the... You can use your, the microphone. Yes, please. I think you might have to open it. Yes, I'm Pierugi Nicodar from the uh, German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. I think it's, it is highly commendable to try to meet uh, and to find a diagnosis for the majority of people with uh, uh, dementia. Uh, on the other hand, I think that setting targets means also setting biases. Uh, in a way, uh, we, we consider dementia uh, as a disease. It is not a disease, it's a syndrome, and, uh, and definitely cannot be diagnosed only by the GPs. Um, I think we would need to be able to have a system in which we have uh, subjective memory impairment to be analyzed first and then follow the patient uh, for a certain period of time in specialized centers to see whether or not they evolve in a classical dementia. Some of them may be depressed and have, of course, cognitive impairment for other reasons. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't disagree with that. I mean, the whole issue of targets is a very interesting one. Um, <clears throat> but it is useful um, to set a bar when you are in a place where there is a significant number of people who uh, have a condition uh, that because it is not diagnosed in time, enormous opportunities are being missed in terms of support for the individual, the family and the carers. And I think this is what led to um, uh, uh, the concept of actually upping the rate of diagnosis. You're quite right. Diagnosis in itself doesn't necessarily mean anything, but the implications of diagnosis for the family and for the individual are really quite significant. Uh, so that was the ideation. Just uh, as a question of clarification, when you talk about diagnosis, you're, you're talking about dementia clinically recognized, not about MCIs. Or do we're, you... talking, we're talking about dementia. Yes. Okay, um, uh, the division between the two, as we know, is really quite interesting. And uh, it's really, uh, uh, there could be a discussion as to where we set the bar here. Yes. Uh, but the diagnosis of dementia, yes. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, well, a last uh, quick comment, uh, Mr. Redenberg. Uh, my question, your comment at the end about uh, we would be better if we acted collegially more in the future than we did in the past. I'd be curious just about how that collegiality gets organized in a way that accelerates our learning across national boundaries. Well, that indeed is a challenge, isn't it? But I, I would suggest that if we thought more about what we can do now, uh, if we thought more about um, perhaps uh, standardizing a lot of the terms we use, uh, if we thought more about uh, making uh, this condition something where if we mention the word dementia, it means the same thing in different countries, will actually assist us, because there still is a, an awful lot of confusion about where dementia starts, an awful lot of confusion where cognitive impairment starts, and an awful lot of confusion around what diagnostic tools to use at the start. I don't think that aids us very much. Thank you so much, and I think we're uh, uh, already in the general discussion we'll have later on, but uh, thanks for these questions, and now I will welcome 
Professor Howard Bergman uh, from Canada, from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, who will uh, give his perspective on the uh, uh, Alzheimer plan and particularly the Quebec Alzheimer plan. Please, Dr. Bergman, you have 10 minutes. Konnichiwa. That will be it from the Japanese. <laughs> I want to thank my for the invitation and, and uh, Professor Kenji Toba for inviting me. Um, we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to choose very carefully what we can say in these 10 minutes. I would say that if we really want to develop a sharing of our, of our, of our experience, I think we need more in-depth time to do this and not just a series of 10 minutes. So these are teasers for, for in-depth discussions that we need to, to develop. So the, the Quebec Alzheimer plan, I was asked to uh, lead this uh, task force to produce, uh, to propose a Quebec Alzheimer plan by the uh, Quebec uh, then Minister of Health, who happens to be the Quebec Prime Minister uh, today. Um, these are the seven priority actions with 24 recommendations. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of them. It will be impossible. I'm going to mention the first one and get a little more into detail in the, in the second one, this question of accessibility. I'm going to ask you, by the way, to read the slides because I'm not going to read each of the, each of the lines on, on the slide. What I'd like to do here is just emphasize um, this approach is drawing on emerging solutions, evidence-based knowledge and research finding, the Canadian international experience, but emerging solutions in Quebec itself in our healthcare system. The second extremely important uh, um, uh, objective we set ourselves is that we would not create an Alzheimer's disease healthcare system. We would use the existing uh, elements of our healthcare system uh, um, and, and uh, to promote uh, improved care and improve accessibility for Alzheimer's disease. So, in terms of, I just want to mention this in terms of raising awareness and particularly on the issue of prevention, um, really our main recommendation is that Alzheimer's disease as a preventive strategy should be incorporated into Quebec's larger public health uh, plan that, that comes out every five or six years around evidence-based risk factors that we, uh, that we know about and that we've all discussed. So let me talk about access to personalized coordinated evaluation and treatment. At the present time in Quebec and most of Canada, probably most of our countries, access is not great. Access is not great to an evaluation of an older person who says, I have a memory problem, I'm a little bit worried. And it's not great to integrated management through the various stages of disease. Memory clinics cannot handle the volume or ensure comprehensive continuity of care. Um, I co-founded and co-led with Dr. Howard Chertko in Montreal at McGill University, the best memory clinic in the world. The best memory clinic in the world, except it takes eight to 12 months to get in, so it may be the best in the world, but not very useful. And I'll come back to that. And so we have long waiting lists, delayed diagnosis and late intervention. Primary care generally is not prepared to deal with patients with, with Alzheimer's disease. By the way, why, do, why is our clinic so uh, long to get into? It's because 85% of what we're doing is primary care. So why is primary care seen as the way forward? You could read this, um, and you know the, 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 the usual thing about primary care being the first contact, longitudinal experience, best trained and equipped to deal with older persons with multimorbidity, you remember, Alzheimer's disease doesn't come alone. Older people have a very nasty habit. They have lots of chronic diseases, not just one. And so who's ever going to be following from a medical point of view and an interdisciplinary point of view needs to be able to, to, to do that. And we need to prepare for the advent of biomarkers and disease-modifying medications. Close your eyes one moment and think of the moment that we have. You haven't closed your eyes. Think of the moment when we have those those biomarkers and disease-modifying medications, are, all they, are they are all going to go to the acute care university hospital? All our healthcare systems will collapse in about three hours. So it's going to happen at the primary care level with support of specialty care. So the other thing I think is important to say is that 
the, the physician, the primary care physician, Dr. Welby for the, the North Americans who are old enough to remember, you know, the, the solo physician uh, taking care of patients, that's over. And that primary care cannot take, take care of complex di chronic diseases. And that's why in Canada we have important primary care reform where, where, where uh, primary care physicians are moved into group practices, team-based, interdisciplinary nurses and other healthcare professionals and interspecialty practice. Now the game has changed in their capacity to, uh, to follow complex uh, chronic diseases. And I would add that Alzheimer's disease is a chronic disease. So the approach is based on the chronic care model. Uh, very interesting papers by Callahan and JAMA. Approach based on the chronic care model and the collaborative practice model. Primary care physician and nurse clinician in partnership with the patient and family in, a, in detection, assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. And the nurse clinician in that family medicine group in primary care plays the role of the Alzheimer pivotal nurse. She's going to be the key person over time that the family and the caregiver is going to relate to with strategic intervention by the physician. We feel that 80% of Alzheimer cases or dementia cases will be seen only in primary care, do not need to be sent to specialty care. I know that goes against some of what other people have been saying. So this primary care model, this primary care approach, needs to have fast, easy, flexible access to specialized resources when necessary. So if I'm a primary care physician, I want to refer to the memory clinic because I'm having a problem with either behavior uh, or, with, um, or with diagnosis, and it takes eight months to get, to get that diagnosis, then that's not going to be very stimulating for me to follow these, uh, to follow these cases. So fast, easy, flexible access to specialized resources, to home care programs, uh, uh, et cetera. As I said, it has to go quickly. So there, what's interesting is usually ministries of health say, okay, here's the policy, we're adopting it. Tomorrow morning, everybody's gonna do it. Start at nine o'clock in the morning. Everybody's gonna do it in the same way everywhere. And by the way, we're not adding any resources to do it. What the Quebec government did, because every once in a while governments do do right things, is there was a decision that there was a budget that we applied. Um, uh, the priority was to enable and empower primary care physicians to detect, diagnose, treat, follow mass, vast majority of, of, of Alzheimer's disease. And the idea was to fund implementation projects in 40 family medicine groups, to learn from those projects, and then to scale up progressively to get better as it scaled up, rather than to roll it out to everybody at the same time. So we produced interdisciplinary proactive trajectories of care with practice guidelines, training strategies focused on training within the practices, and uh, as I said, evaluation for scaling up. Now, I promised Howard Churko I would talk about the Canadian Consortium of Neurodegenerative Diseases on Aging, and we have one of the teams in that, uh, in that consortium uh, which has a $35 million budget, and one of the teams is on the assessment of the Im implementation of Alzheimer plan within primary care. So the Canadian team, as we call ourselves, the Canadian team for healthcare services system improvement dementia care, evaluate uh, interventions in Quebec and Ontario, and the idea is where interventions are going on, the idea is not to say you're good, you're bad. The idea is to refine the intervention, identify key components and key contextual factors for, for scaling up, and to facilitate this rapid dissemination and, and scaling up. And we're using innovative, transformative approaches in terms of methodology, uh, using integration of research, knowledge, and transfer, participatory research with my Department of Family Medicine, McGill, is a world pioneer, developmental evaluation. Rapid as the study of unfolds, uh, 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 providing feedback to the sites. We're generally not supposed to do this, right? You're not supposed to tell the mouse how they're doing in the, in the, in the experimentation, but in, develop, in this developmental evaluation, there is a relationship between the researchers and the, and the sites in order to allow the sites to improve themselves as they go along. Setting up partnerships, the research team is actively engaged with four involved stakeholder groups, decision makers, uh, patients, families, administrators, clinicians, industry, 
with the Canadian Partners Council and an in, uh, International Advisory Committee, by the way, with representatives from two middle-income countries because Alzheimer's disease is a, an important uh, uh, challenge for the middle and even some low-income countries. So, in conclusion, um, uh, these developing implementation projects with the perspective of scaling up by identifying key elements for rapid health system change based in primary medical care, closely linked and supported by specialty care, interdisciplinary clinical leadership. It's really a paradigm for management of multiple chronic disease uh, in older persons. It's a, a terrific opportunity for training students, residents, and graduate students, a true partnership of researchers, decision makers, etc., and the basis for an ongoing Canadian international research and policy network. So for those of you uh, who have any trouble sleeping at night, I would suggest you download one of these in the language of your choice. It works remarkably well. And if you print it out, you can actually spread it on your floor when you do some painting in your house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Berkman. Um, some questions of clarification. I imagine uh, that uh, when you uh, use the concept of Alzheimer, you're referring to dementia. Yes. Okay. Referring to dementia. In fact, what are we referring to? We're referring to older people who present, who may have memory problems. We're referring to older people who say, I'm a little bit worried about my memory and I want to get an evaluation. If we look at those numbers, they're much greater than the numbers of people with dementia, with MCI, and I think we have to take that into account in terms of accessibility to evaluation. Thank you. Any other clarification? Quick question. If not, we'll come back because uh, we're starting to see some uh, complement uh, complementary approaches here. And I will now ask uh, Dr. Florence Pasquier from the Université de Lille et du Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Lille in France to uh, share with us the French Organization of Care for Patients with Young Onset Dementia. Florence, you have a whole 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have no disclosure for this specific topic. Uh, sorry. Yes, but... Uh, okay, sorry. So the definition of early onset dementia is, uh, as uh, it said, uh, onset before the age of 65, and the prevalence and incidence of uh, dementia doubles every five years from 35 years. And the number is, uh, varies according to uh, the dementia, the causes of dementia that are included. Ah. I'm sorry, I cannot. Ah. The prevalence is uh, about uh, 50 to 80 uh, per 100,000 inhabitants, uh, 10 to 15 uh, new cases per 100,000 inhabitants per year, as many men as women. And uh, just as an example, in the UK it was uh, uh, calculated that uh, about uh, 18,000 uh, patients uh, were uh, demented before the age of 65. Problem is, sorry. I have a problem, sorry. Okay, on the left. Okay, thank you. Uh, the distinctive features for young onset dementia is mainly the delay in establishing a proper diagnosis with uh, the time between the first symptom and the diagnosis two years more than in uh, older patients. And the uh, illness is often considered by the general public and many professionals as a disease of the elderly. And in addition, there are differ many differential diagnoses and atypical features that leads to difficult diagnosis and to uh, the, the expertise is mandatory. 
So these are the different causes of dementia in these uh, young patients, not only degenerative vascular, but also inflammatory, traumatic, and so on. And this is an example in the north of France for 4 million inhabitants. In total, the Alzheimer's disease account for two-thirds of, uh, uh, of the causes of dementia, uh, only uh, less than half in uh, younger patients. The second uh, characteristic of young onset uh, dementia is the importance of psychiatric symptoms with a frequent history of depression and a lot of frontal lobe symptoms. And uh, this leads to misdiagnosis, uh, psychiatric misdiagnosis. And the first uh, diagnosis that this young patient receives is depression. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, there are also atypical clinical features with prominent instrumental uh, cognitive deficits in language or visual spatial function, which is very discon uh, disconcerting uh, if uh, amnesia does not seem very impaired. And there are also more focal atrophies and in younger patients, less anosognosia. The genetic forms are five times more frequent than in older patients. And all this contributes to misdiag uh, misdiagnosis and misleading to diagnosis because uh, there are also some neurological symptoms like uh, paraparesia that, uh, is, uh, that are misleading. Uh, moreover, uh, is the hippocampal atrophy, which is typical of Alzheimer's disease, maybe not so prominent uh, compared to the uh, global atrophy in these uh, young patients. However, uh, the workup helped to, uh, um, to make a proper diagnosis with the FTD PET or the amyloid tracers or even CSF, which is very typical of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, the, the message is that young patients should be referred to tertiary centers. Now, the medical social characteristic of young onset dementia uh, caregivers of young patients are stunned by uh, an unexpected diagnosis, and they belong to the sandwich generation. Caregivers are not only responsible for their ill spouse, but also for their children and for their parents or parents-in-law. Uh, they suffer for, uh, from a health problem, and they took uh, and they take they take uh, more uh, treatment uh, psychological treatment than uh, individuals of the same age they have few respite and they are anxious about heredity of the disease and the end of life their main complaint is uh, the behavioral changes of the patient and the difficult communications and the constant and uh, and uh, consistent express needs are the early recognition and referral and uh, also the lack of dedicated care uh, uh, facilities and financial support. So with this knowledge, two measures were conducted in, uh, with the third French Alzheimer plan, with two measures. Uh, one was the setting of a reference center, and after a call for a proposal, a multi-site reference was uh, chosen with uh, three complementary uh, memory clinics uh, with uh, uh, different expertise. And this uh, reference center is linked with the 26 memory resource and research centers. And we are now just a community. And the aims of this uh, center is uh, care management with the view of public health, research, and international collaboration. For CARE, the first point was to raise awareness in professionals and general public through conferences, media, communications, reviews, and uh, the setting of uh, uh, um, websites. And the uh, um, priority was to improve the diagnosis and the genetic testing by uh, identify, uh, with the identification of a reference specialist, usually a neurologist, uh, for young onset dementia in each memory clinic. And uh, uh, we started also continuous training, educational publication, ethics meetings, and we implemented procedure in uh, genetics and in uh, CSF sampling, imaging, and neuropathology. And especially in genetics, we have now uh, identified more than 150 families with uh, uh, mutation uh, for Alzheimer's disease and uh, many families with uh, frontotemporal dementia mutations. 
For management, we also identify the reference in each uh, memory research and resource center, usually a social worker, but it can be also a psychologist or a nurse. And we train professionals with the help of France Alzheimer. And we published for professionals. And again, they, there are food in the websites for professionals. And there were a lot of initiatives uh, to support uh, caregivers, like support groups, thematic daycares, uh, weekends for young onset dementia with the UTB Foundation, and the photographic work to destigmatize de uh, the young onset uh, dementia and point out the specificity of different causes of dementia. And uh, there were uh, a lot of procedure, mobical, parkour, and a specific uh, long visit um, uh, framework to, for, for helping general practitioners to, um, uh, to look for the specificities of patients with young onset dementia. And finally, there was the, another measure about accommodation and facilities for young onset dementia. And the aim of this measure was to evaluate uh, the quantitative and qualitative needs. And uh, if specificities uh, have been detected for accommodation for young patients, to synthesize the propositions. So the course of patients, uh, we looked at the epidemiological context, and we, uh, thanks, with, thanks to uh, the Foundation uh, Mederic Alzheimer, we made a national survey with a questionnaire sent to all the facilities that were possibly uh, able to uh, welcome young patients. Uh, more than 10,000 questionnaires were sent, and uh, we show that out of 2,400 young patients living in collective accommodation at that time, 220 suffered from Alzheimer's disease or associated disorders. So we also uh, done, have done a documentary uh, to help um, support for uh, raising awareness and discussion and training. And we questioned if the number of beds were, uh, uh, meet the, the needs with uh, a lot of questionnaires and uh, meetings. We also uh, had a professional meeting, a two-day seminar, and a one-day meeting with uh, young patients themselves, those who were able to express their needs in public and who wish to be actors of their life. And with that, we uh, made a synthesis with a one-day uh, meeting for all the, to uh, uh, give all the synthesis of what we have observed. And the, so the, the main um, observation that was that uh, uh, young onset dementia specificity, disconcert and worry relatives as well as professionals, and uh, young patients are scarce and dispersed in nursing homes, usually dedicated to old people, they have, uh, there is a difficult relationship between the young patients and the staff because of their distress and the painful projection. And no such problem with, with uh, the other residents, even older residents. And uh, what was constant uh, was the need for training and support uh, for the staff in uh, this uh, community um, of these uh, 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 facilities. Um, the observation also about the need, uh, the situation needing an entry in a collective sitting was uh, three conditions. One was a loss of autonomy, the second was a behavioral crisis, the third was a long-term accommodation needed because of severe behavioral troubles or somatic problems. And we also saw that many services was already appropriate. However, age was often the cause of supplementary distress. The limitation of this work that we focused only on Alzheimer's disease and related disorders and the, the specific situation of patients with mental retardation was not taken into account, especially for Down syndromes. So we had some orientations and the uh, points that were specifically uh, f um, raised by the professionals. The research was achieved by a cohort of young onset patients and the uh, identification of new genes and uh, uh, participation in social and human science. The international uh, collaborations were made possible with this uh, organization in participating in Diane and Genfi too. 
And in conclusion, I was just focused on the fact that the needs of young patients of today are also those of older patients in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pasquier. So uh, a very interesting uh, point of view on, the, on, a, on a specific subpopulation of, of those uh, having to live with dementia. Any specific comments at this point? Or uh, yes, in the back, and please uh, identify yourself. Florence, you have a microphone. Uh, you have to use a microphone, yes. Dr. Nakamura uh, from uh, uh, Alzheimer Association Japan uh, in Kyoto. Uh, we have, um, well, uh, Tsudoi meeting. Tsudoi will be presented uh, next session. Um, meeting with young um, early onset dementia people. Uh, every four months and small scale, and because they have many uh, problems, uh, medical or social or economical, and uh, the uh, progress of the disease is so rapid, and so we have to uh, take care of them uh, rather often. And do you have, um, uh, Dr. Pasky, um, have s something like uh, that kind of meeting in France or Paris? Uh, yes, we have some meetings uh, run by the association uh, called um, Alzheimer Cafe or um, support groups, and some are, are really dedicated to young patients, and especially one in the north of France was dedicated for them. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this uh, information and providing this extra information. So we'll. Uh, uh, follow up on the discussion in the general discussion period. But for the time being, we will move forward and we will welcome P Dr. Peter Whitehouse, both from Case Western Reserve University and the University of uh, Toronto. And Dr. Whitehouse, uh, your point of view on uh, providing timely and appropriate support, so from, from labels to legacy. Peter. Thank you, uh, Professor Joanat Hasegawa Sensei, and for the invitation to be back once again in Japan. I want to talk about labels to legacy. So I will start with a critique of the medical labeling process and end up with some comments about legacy in community. The story of Alzheimer's disease and dementia is changing. And I thank the Alzheimer's Society of Canada for my t-shirt. It, it allows me to emphasize that we are talking about data, we are talking about evidence, but we are also talking particularly in a policy framework about the use of words and the stories that go along with them. Labels, timely, isn't that interesting? What do we mean by timely? It means in part that the patient, the family, has some conversation, some control over when this process begins. But I ask why are we labeling for what purpose and with what label? In the conversation with Howard and uh, Professor uh, Eve, you heard this confusion already. Alzheimer's, dementia, what is the label we are applying? And when you get to mild cognitive impairment, you have a remarkably unstable story. Experts don't agree. Primary care doctors throw up their hands and patients are confused. Now we have preclinical or asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease and subjective cognitive impairment. So I think we have to be very cautious as a physician in applying labels that we ourselves are not sure about. I think we all have aging associated cognitive challenges. Dementia is a changing label. You have already heard in this meeting that Japan led the way not only in its own country but in Asia in Taiwan, in Korea, in changing the name for dementia. This is a public health campaign. Remarkable. The American psychiatrists are less remarkable. They try to change the word from dementia to major neurocognitive disorder, and everybody seems to be ignoring them, even American neurologists. But this effort is a public health effort, which we have studied with great interest. But the, one, the focus I want to make on the labeling is Alzheimer's. I personally believe 
that Alzheimer's is dying. It is an outmoded concept. It is cognitively challenged. It is not a coherent concept anymore. And I think the G7 process is part of the process politically to de-emphasize the label Alzheimer's. Look at your own documents. Change the name of the Alzheimer's Society, perhaps. That's my challenge. I wrote a book. It's controversial, but I think Alzheimer's is not one condition. It is not a singular noun. It is a pluralistic, heterogeneous concept that affects people in different ways, and it is related to brain aging. There is no test that can separate out Alzheimer's from severe brain aging. So I think cures or cure or cures are very difficult to even imagine. What do we mean by a cure? Would that mean people going back to normal? I think the word cure is more often used by politicians and people raising money than it is by serious scientists who are investigating the basic biologies of these conditions. So I believe that Japan is on the forefront of looking at community and looking at this Pro these processes in a different way. But before I go to Japan, let me just re re review with you some of the complexities and the new guidelines that come from America. The title of this paper in The Lancet, Organizing the Language of Alzheimer's Disease in the Light of Biomarkers. It's organizing the language. Risa Sperling, who is the principal investigator of the A4 study in the United States, which is giving uh, amyloid uh, 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 immunotherapy to pe normal people with positive amyloid scans, says herself that she cannot tell aging from Alzheimer's disease. And yet we are promoting these guidelines to identify people who have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So if we don't know where our aging begins and Alzheimer's disease ends, what are we doing with these, um, these huge studies? Even Bradley Hyman, another neurologist from Harvard who is an expert on the hippocampus, says to me that he cannot tell the difference when he looks at the hippocampus between aging and Alzheimer's disease except by a matter of degree. So I'm saying to you that at both ends, the early attempts to diagnose it before symptoms, and at the end when you have the brain in front of you, we are confused about what Alzheimer's disease. And biomarkers are unproven. In many ways, they are unproven. But they are being actively promoted. In the United States, they are educating doctors to use these scans without the evidence that they are beneficial to people, in my opinion. And even Eli Lilly is su suing or joining a suit against the United States government who has refused to pay for these scans using uh, Medicare dollars. So the basic science studies are also challenged. Mice do not get Alzheimer's disease. They get Mouseheimer's disease. And the studies, the, the NAPA process has told us how much we know is wrong about the use of animal models in trying to understand human disease. So care is not something we should only do while we're waiting for a cure. We have to care for the rest of our life as a species. So we need to focus on communities that are age-friendly and dementia-friendly. Uh, Otani-san from Omuro City is here talking about the initial efforts that we've been celebrating in Japan. In Germany, I make the point here that dementia-friendly communities have to involve the first responders, the police, the fire, it also needs to involve children. We cannot provide age-friendly children uh, communities, dementia-friendly communities, without thinking about the children of our communities. Schools are an essential part of human communities, and intergenerational intergener relationships, I believe, are key to creating friendlier communities. This is our school in Cleveland. We now have three schools. We're working, we have a, a partner school in Tokyo. We have a partners in Canada. This is a school in which my patients with dementia, like the young lady uh, with early onset dementia, go to school with children. They read to children. They tell stories with children. We did a randomized controlled study in which we showed in the qualitative results that these interventions are beneficial for the adults with dementia who participate in the lives of children. In Japanese, we would say that they get ikigai, they have a sense of self or worth, a sense of purpose that they gain. There are health benefits. In the randomized control study, there was less stress in the group of people that came to the school with dementia who volunteered with the children than those that stayed in a nursing home and worked with their peers. 
there is a sense of purpose, and there are also relationships. This is so important. The children in our school do not treat people with dementia any differently than they would treat any other human being. They are aware that they have memory problems, and they adapt to that. But those people with dementia are part of a learning community in which the children and the adults both benefit. And I might add, my wife is the chief educator of our three schools, and they are the high, some of the highest performing charter schools, community public schools in the state of Ohio for the children. So this in English is a twofer. There's a benefit for children by engaging the, the adults and a benefit for the, uh, the adults by engaging with children. I want to talk about two legacy projects. We are here to talk about legacy. So these are our children from the school interviewing a patient with dementia, Kay Fuller. I'm using all the names and pictures with permission. In the 1960s, she fought against some corrupt politicians that wanted to put a highway right through the nature center that our children today visit. So she saved the nature center 50 years ago. And she is telling stories to those students so those students can be empire, empowered to save that nature center for generations to follow. The children wrote a book, we took photographs, and we wrote about the legacy of the Clark Freeway fighters. And now the book is used to educate children about their, their responsibilities for nature. And both Mrs. Fuller and Mrs. Barber are ladies with dementia who have subsequently died, but their legacy goes on. And we even published this in a book in the uh, Journal of the American Geriatric Society called Occupy Nature, Passing Activism Across the Generations, the importance of being in a natural community with each other. And finally, one last project, the Legacy Center in Toronto works with communities on a project called U-177, Young, Old, United, One Planet, Seven Generations, Seven Billion People, where people with dementia work on telling stories and dreaming about a healthy community in which they work together across the generations and in this picture there are people with dementia. So I ask you, what is the legacy of the World Dementia Council going to be? Here is Dennis Gillings giving a presentation in Puerto Rico last, earlier this year where he used these words, dementia is a ticking bomb. I don't like that metaphor. But he uses words like pure, care, conquer. These are the big words. I'm glad care is there, but I think that uh, Dr. Gillings and the World Dementia Council is changing to an attitude that is more balanced between biological research and public health and community work. And I think the, the conference here in Japan is going to help them move further in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Whitehouse. Any point of clarification? I would ask you, uh, and, and since you, you say, you know, care is not only while, while waiting for a cure, and I, I certainly agree, but so would you suggest to abandon any uh, type of research trying to understand whatever the concept you want to label it? Could you please use the microphone just because it's... it's we I believe in uh, the oriental concept of harmony and balance. Okay. All I'm saying is we are out of balance. And I, I am a neuroscientist. I study the brain. I, the brain is important, but so is community. Thanks for the, uh, the balance uh, in, in, in your balance. If we don't have any other uh, specific questions, thanks, uh, Peter. We'll um, go to the next uh, presentation by Francesca Colombo. And Francesca is here on behalf of the OECD group, which, uh, should I remind, is in support of the World Dementia Council as well. And so uh, thanks for being here with us, Francesca, and uh, sharing some of the highlights of the reports you've done uh, with your colleagues. Yeah. Um I will naturally not present the report that will be presented tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be done by, uh, by my colleague, um, Mark Pearson, tomorrow. So I, I was thinking, what can I say which is not really going to be a repetition of what will be said tomorrow? I know the repetition event, but perhaps in this case, I thought about highlighting some uh, high-level, perhaps uh, uh, three or four points that I think are, are important. Now, the starting point we go, before getting in these three or four points 
is uh, perhaps the, what, what the, the previous speaker said, the need for balance. <coughs> We're pretty much pleased that there is an event, a legacy event, which focused on, on, uh, the, on the, the care side, because it's true, we don't have a cure, and millions of people are living with uh, dementia right now. But I guess when looking at dementia, um, which is a very complex uh, condition, there is perhaps uh, a hope that we can learn a lot uh, about how to improve care more broadly for people with complex uh, care needs. I mean, in, in a sense, dementia is a particular condition. But what happens when people have dementia is quite symptomatic of why, why there are problems in our healthcare systems and in our social care systems. And I think there is an opportunity here in the discussion that we have today to really you know, come up with uh, concrete ideas that can have a, a wider applications to the health system as a whole and not just specifically on, uh, on, uh, on dementia. So in a sense, we need to have not just uh, you know, like a dementia care system, but really a care system recognizing the fact that people with dementia very often have uh, multiple chronic conditions. So they have a dementia and in addition, they do have um, a lot of uh, other different things. And it is true that there is some confusions because the labeling, the medical labeling has been uh, really quite difficult. What are we uh, talking about? But I guess you know, the starting point for, uh, would be really to look at the complexity of the issues in a more holistic way. With that in mind, I think I would like to focus on four main things. The first main thing is really coordination. I mean, coordination when talking about uh, dementia uh, care seems to be a very critical uh, point. Uh, there is coordination uh, issues between the healthcare system, the medical system, and the social care systems. Uh, people with dementia, where do they go? Do they fit in the long-term care um, uh, services uh, that exist and in the coverage system for that, or are they part of the medical systems? They're often going between the two and in a rather uncoordinated matters. So this is a, a really a, a critical um, uh, challenge. There is an issue in coordination that uh, relates to the information infrastructure that we have, uh, because uh, it's, uh, the information is not really traveling through the systems. So with people who have very complex uh, uh, care needs, the possibility of uh, linking up different data sets to have a more complete picture, it's really critical to have this coordination done uh, in, a, in a proper way. Or even we know that, uh, some, that very often dementia is not even recognized um, in a medical uh, care system uh, because the coding of uh, uh, diagnosis is not properly done. If uh, a patient with dementia goes into hospital for, I don't know, it's like a, a fracture, uh, the fact that this person has dementia may not be even be recognized. So there is a lot in the information system that can be done that would be really facilitating the uh, coordination. I think there is a need for coordinations between workforce. So I think it was mentioned the idea of multidisciplinary uh, team uh, working uh, together. Again, it's when we talk about multidisciplinary, I would stress the needs to look at the medical, so the doctors, the nurses, but also, and especially the caregivers, the care providers, and the, the family as well. So coordination, I think, is the uh, first uh, main thing. The second issue is, uh, is measuring, which I think is critically important, and it has to do with the fact that we want to have accountability for results, and you cannot have accountability for these results if you don't have proper metrics and measurements. There are obviously difficulties sometimes in measuring because, yes, the labeling, the names which are being used are different, but there is a fundamental failure of our health and social care systems to really think, agree on some basic, basic metrics to measure uh, progress uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, dementia care. In more, perhaps, medical uh, aspects, um, the use of, uh, of drugs uh, uh, for treatment of behavioral psychotic system of dementias, but even uh, things such as uh, looking at pressure ulcers or um, even uh, uh, falls in, uh, in uh, nursing homes and in, uh, in uh, um, in hospitals and so forth, and down to more, uh, perhaps more measures which are more subtle about the coordinations uh, into the systems. I think we're still very much a long way even to agreeing on some basic 
uh, metrics that should help us to uh, be held to account and to monitor progress uh, uh, into the future. So measuring is my second point. The third point, which I think is critically important, is evaluation. Uh, we are hearing uh, a lot about very uh, interesting um, examples, local level initiatives, sometimes scaling up, sometimes not scaling up. Uh, what is tremendously difficult is to evaluate what works and what doesn't work, simply because there is a implementation of initiatives and there is no follow-through evaluation of these in initiatives. Even in the use, the role of technology, which is something which I think Japan is very much at the forward in really trying to um, have technology uh, be part of, uh, of the picture for caring for, uh, for people with dementia. But what evaluation exists really of the technology where we have? Uh, how can we say to what extent technology complements or substitutes for uh, human uh, resources? There are new models of care, um, the neural nurses, for example, what role nurses have and how do we evaluate the, the unique contribution that nurses uh, might have. So I think the evaluation is so critically important because we still don't have. I mean, we have looked at a review of uh, uh, both the literature, we ask countries, uh, things that will be presented tomorrow, and we found that there is really extraordinarily uh, little evaluation. So that's my uh, third point. My last point, I think, is about uh, patient-centered care. <clears throat> the healthcare system, the social care systems, are really very much silos. There are silos between health and social care. There are silos within the healthcare, what happens in hospital, what happens in primary care, what happens in different uh, parts of the system. Uh, but it's always with the patients being in a sense, moving around the system without really being the front and center of, uh, of the system. And, and recognizing the uh, complexity of dementia, which is not one unique um, uh, disease per se, but it's really, it's a much more complex uh, conditions. Uh, I think having, moving to more personalized uh, care, it's something which is really quite important. It does not mean that we don't need to have guidelines or standardizations in some ways. That's really quite important for improving the quality of care. But I think there needs to be much more of uh, uh, the starting point should be much more the patients, the, 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 the person who is uh, pretty much uh, at the center. And what that means in practical terms uh, means trying to uh, look, um, evaluate, and uh, investigate what happened through the pathway uh, of a person needing dementia in all the different aspects, the social care, the role of uh, family uh, carers, <clears throat> uh, the role of children that was, uh, uh, was mentioned in uh, one of the presentations. So it's how all these different act uh, um, actors can contribute to patient-centered uh, 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 um, uh, care. So I think those are the, the, the three issues that I would like uh, to highlight as critically important. I mentioned coordination, I mentioned measuring, I mentioned evaluation and I mentioned patient-centered uh, care. I think there is uh, hope that some of the uh, initiatives are really moving in that direction. There's definitely scope for international collaborations in all of these areas, in sharing useful practices, in working with metrics, um, something which is uh, uh, particularly uh, important, obviously. So we very much look forward to you know, any future uh, developments and uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for this uh, summary of, of some of the uh, important aspects to keep in mind. And I think it opens the uh, thinking for some uh, cross-national uh, comparison between some of the experiences we just, uh, we just heard. So if we do, we, we have here a uh, clarification question. So the microphone is coming to you from the other end of the room. Just please wait. And again, I will invite you to identify yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Hughes from the Alzheimer's Society UK. Um, just two comments on Francesca's excellent presentation. The first one is around evaluation. Uh, to put in and, and ask her to clarify, to me, the importance is that it is a cost-related evaluation because it seems to be one of the challenges is not just evaluating whether an intervention, an approach is effective, but what is the cost both to the state in terms of state-funded systems, but also the cost to the family, the community, 
and how sustainable is that cost with the long-term nature of dementia, where for 10 years or more you may be incurring considerable costs. So it's an ask about cost-related uh, measurement of, and evaluation. The second, just to give an example of patient-centered care, because I think what she said is very important, to give you one story of somebody I met recently in, in the UK who had looked at the number of different health and care professionals that had intervened for her husband who had dementia in the last two years of his life. And she said she had counted 83 different people who had come into contact with her and her husband. And most of the 83 didn't seem to know what the other 82 were doing. And so the, it was not patient-centered, it was system-focused rather than patient-focused. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. And just before giving the, uh, the microphone to Dr. Berkman, who I think will react, I was wondering, when you, when you say cost analysis, you're, you're talking about financial costs, but do you include social costs? I, I, think, I think it's both. I was meaning particularly financial costs, because I think one of the issues that every government needs to face is that the current system in most countries, and we heard many examples this morning, is, is unaffordable in 10 years' time. Uh, so it's the, the financial cost, but of course for the family, uh, it is also the social cost and the problems created of isolation uh, and, and the discrimination that people face as well. Professor Bergman, you want to say a word here? Uh, and just, just to pick up on the, the last issue that you raised about the number of, of people you come in contact with, what, one of the essential elements of the plan that that is being uh, put into place is this notion is when you're getting the evaluation, when you get the diagnosis, you fall into a black hole. And, and what we said is, and we based ourselves on a model used in Quebec around oncology patients, where the oncologist works with a nurse that's sometimes called pivotal nurse or nurse navigator. And that, that nurse is a credible clinician for the family and the patient. And so when there's a problem that comes up, that's the person throughout the course of the disease that the family can turn to and develop a relationship with over time. And so the idea is once the diagnosis is given, this nurse uh, has a discussion, a long discussion, and says to the family, here's my card. If you need to speak to somebody, phone me if you have a question. And if you don't phone me, I'm going to phone you in two weeks. That's what we call proactive care. And I'm going to see you at such and such a time. And so this person becomes what we call the pivotal nurse, the pivot, um, in a very long and complicated journey because our healthcare systems are very complex. So how, how much does it cost? Four dollars and twenty-three cents. Thank you. It doesn't cost, no, but seriously, um, what we did not do is create a new position. Uh, in the family medicine groups, there are nurses, nurse clinicians, and nurse practice, practitioners who are, who are responsible for working together with the physicians in managing uh, uh, patients with chronic disease. So this is one of those nurses, has as part of her role, playing this role of the pivotal nurse for Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the chronic diseases. And by the way, she'll be following them for the other chronic diseases as well, because the patient is not going to go from one, one uh, nurse to another for their, all their chronic diseases. Can, can I just, uh, to respond, I think that's, that's a, an excellent model. Uh, and one that we would support, and in the UK we're developing a role called the Dementia Advisor, who is exactly that person who acts as the navigator and the support. Uh, but the problem is resources. Because of the long-term condition nature of dementia, the difference from when I worked in, in cancer, of course with oncology, with cancer, you have an intervention that may be for two, three, four, five years maximum with a declining level of intervention. The problem with dementia is being able to sustain financially the level of support. So we have dementia advisors in the UK who have 1,000 clients on their books, uh, which is unsustainable, but because the resource is not available sufficiently to have a, and, the, and whether that's a community nurse, a, a family doctor, it could be different people's, people, as you say, but it's just looking at how sustainable is that system. So we did and not- then we'll, we'll extend yes, to the we did not create a new position because exactly that reason. These are nurses who already work 
in these family medicine groups. And this is just be part of their responsibility. And for each of them, there's not an enormous amount of patients. Um, so it's not an added on cost for the, for the healthcare system. Now, if one of the family medicine groups has lots of older people, maybe that group will get an extra nurse to work with the physicians. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Because I think we're morphing into the uh, more general uh, discussion. So I, I, I would invite any of the speakers to comment on the other speakers, respectfully, of course. Um, so, uh, Dr. Yamakuchi. Yes. Uh, now I can uh, answer to, my, uh, to me. Uh, that the cost for the in initial phase and intensive support team, we did uh, uh, actual, um, actually in last year. And it takes about high 500 US dollars for one patient. That so that's the cost for the early intervention. And, and probably in the future, you will be able to measure the impact and the savings, so to say, in terms of finance, for uh, linked with the impact of this early intervention in maybe delaying some of the clinical signs or the clinical challenges. But that's going to be for the future. Any other comments? Because we've, we've heard models which were more specifically designed for dementia. We heard approaches which were for specific population like Dr. Pasquier. We heard more um, health uh, system uh, basics uh, integrated model. Um, we will not leave the room without uh, knowing which is the best one. So um, Dr. Okochi. Um, it's, it's also re uh, re linked to the cost. Usually our patient in nursing a long-time care facilities is referred by local clinician with uh, a lot of medications, which includes donepezil and, and other anti-Alzheimer drugs, which has been prescribed for these patients over years. And we don't know when to stop. There's no guy in Japan. In the U.S., it, they are talking about when, how to stop, when to stop donepezil and other uh, anti-Alzheimer drug. In our facility, we think the rehabilitation as a way to stop medication and implement other way without drug, but still improving their quality of life. And I think this way of approach, not... Uh, based on medication, but it's also, it benefits patients QOL. I think, it, I think this way of thinking is important. That's my comment. Thank you, and I suspect Peter Whitehouse wants to say a word here. So with could you, could, um, I'm not sure it's open. So um, I have a comment and a question for um, Francisco. So it seems to me on the issue of cost, we can look for, opportunities to develop programs that benefit more gr than one group. So I would argue that in all of our societies, Germany, Italy, Japan, we've heard about our countries with low birth rates, for example, that programs that benefit children and older people together might be worthwhile considering. But the question I have for Francesca, who, who like many people, emphasized evidence. These are complex diseases. These are complex interventions. It seems to me we can't do a randomized controlled study of absolutely everything. So what's your comment about can we develop new forms of evidence uh, to respond to your, the need for evidence? Thank you. Francesca, you have also a microphone and you just have to open it. Yeah. It's a $1 million uh, question. No, I think there is a lot that can be done even in simple evaluations, simple indicators, which at the moment do not exist, of the basic quality uh, of care for people that, uh, that have dementia. I mean, it's a, I realize that it's a, it's a very complex conditions. Um, there is no disagreement on that. But until you start collecting data uh, and indicators which are the same standardized across different um, countries as well, it's very difficult then to uh, say which model is working best or not. Obviously, I mean, it's, it's, it would be very difficult to come up with any ranking. It's not the purpose of that. But you need to disaggregate a bit more um, and look at 
uh, more specific indicators to have a much uh, richer pictures. And we do have information systems that are helping us increasingly more, but the data which is collected is not used in, uh, in productive ways. I mean, there is information which is contained in uh, electronic medical records uh, in a number of, of, of countries, which contains information about the way people with dementia, as well as other conditions, uh, receive uh, uh, treatments. And not in all countries this data is uh, used to or linked to other information data sets that exist to have a much richer understanding of the pathway that um, the person with dementia and with other chronic conditions goes through. So I think there is a lot that can be done in that space. Um, I have another comment on the issues of costs. I mean, there, uh, it has been uh, uh, mentioned by previous speakers the, impo the impo importance of uh, cost uh, related evaluations and so forth. When talking about costs, there is always this idea of like, oh, we are asking our health and social care system to, go, to do more, so it's going to cost more. But there is an awful lot of uh, waste, unfortunately, in, in the health and the social care system that we should be doing something about. For example, people with dementia end up too much into hospitals and stay for very long time in hospitals. I mean, we have, we have some data in OECDs. We're talking really about an average length of stay for people with dementia, which is sometimes in the order of three, four, even 10 times longer than the uh, average length of stay for a, another person. And we know that hospitals is not the good place uh, for a person with dementia. And how much does hospitals cost? So there are ways to, uh, through improving the coordination of the system, to perhaps free up some resources that can be more productively used in other parts of the, of the system. Thank you for uh, bringing attention to the system cost and not necessarily to the program cost. And second, I just want to comment that anyone near the field would be uh, pessimistic in, in, in hoping that the same exact measures will be taken everywhere, but at least uh, to have some level of interoperability between these uh, measures would be already a big change. But uh, I would like to uh, offer the possibility to comment to Dr. Alessi. Thank you. I'm just reflecting on, 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 on all the presentations and really on this afternoon, and I think there are two main themes which are very, very clear to me. Um, <clears throat> I think one is that uh, we have to be thinking in terms of making our systems far more effective for the individual. And clearly, the role of the out-of-hospital sector, the role of primary care is perhaps something which may provide some salvation. I say some because I don't think it's the answer, but I think it moves towards the answer. Having that longitudinal record and having that very long association for such a complex condition clearly is, is something which is uh, to our advantage. But I think, that, I think there's another theme which uh, really is becoming clearer, that the answer here is not going to be biomedical. The answer here is going to be beyond that. It's going to be societal, and it's also going to be around the individual. Uh, and I think we've got to be thinking far more about empowering the individual to make life choices from very, very, uh, very much earlier than perhaps we have, and thinking around these conditions as being things which we need to start thinking of very much before they start to appear. There's an inevitability about that, and I think we're at a stage now where that inevitability is becoming uh, an opportunity too good to miss. Dr. Ikeda. Uh, uh, it is a uh, very important uh, cost-related issue, but uh, I think it may be uh, relatively easy uh, to build up the uh, medical system or the caring system at transient in each uh, region. But a uh, uh, quite important issue is uh, how to cultivate the professionals. Uh, not only the specialist, uh, GP and nurses, but also the occupational therapist and uh, 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 caring staffs uh, and even the uh, community supporters. So in uh, today's uh, many, many unique uh, system in each region, how to uh, develop the specialist is uh, important uh, next few uh, decades. Thank you, and thanks for mentioning the uh, non-professional carers as well, because uh, they are at the forefront of, of um, many of those care. Uh, they're 
typically in most countries I know, very poorly trained and very badly prepared uh, tooled to uh, to do their job. But that's 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 important. Thanks for mentioning this. Um, Dr. Bergman, I suspect you have just, something. Just on the question of evaluation, an yeah. essential question. We can't make change without evaluation. Mm -hmm. But I think we need some methodological work to make sure that what we're and how we're evaluating is properly. One of the things that has been developed through our department and is, is, is now used more and more is called participatory research. And normally when we do an evaluation, the researchers sit down, scratch their heads and other parts of their bodies, and say, what are the outcomes that we're going to be measuring? Participatory research says you get together with the community that you're evaluating, you get together with the stakeholders and say, what are the important outcomes for you? So an important outcome for a minister may be money, but not might be the not same important outcome for the clinician, for the family, for the patient, et cetera. So to bring together these, these outcomes. The second thing I think is extremely important is we need to be able to develop qualitative research and mixed methods in order to understand the process of change and how change is taken up. Too often, and I've been involved in, in projects that are demonstration projects, and because of the pioneer effect, they work. And then you set it out into the community and it doesn't work. Because we haven't looked at what are the processes necessary to make this change sustainable. So the use of this qualitative research and mixed methods in order to do that. I can go on, I'm sure you don't want me to, nope. my friend Eve, but I think this also should be the, obje the object of a, of a discussion, in-depth discussion, of how we're evaluating these changes that we're making to our healthcare system. We kept talking about money, money is important, but there are all, a lot of other factors that are linked to that. Thanks, Professor Beckman. Um, we are approaching the end, so uh, please uh, don't hesitate if you have uh, some comments or uh, please, in the back here, we need uh, a microphone. It's coming from your left or from, from the air. Thanks for identifying yourself. Uh, I'm Imanaka from Kyoto University. Uh, Mr. Jeremy Hughes from UK just pointed out the importance of sustainability of the system, and this is very important in this uh, limited resource era. And, uh, and also, how to lead normal life is very important. And so uh, development of specialists is uh, very important, but on the other hand, uh, development of communities, uh, people, uh, are also uh, essential. And um, <coughs> uh, Professor, uh, Professor Peter Whitehouse uh, presented for us uh, cross-generation activities, including involving young generations, uh, children. And th that, that is very attractive and promising. And uh, in Japan, uh, uh, there is a great movement of dementia supporter caravan. And we have a lot of dementia supporters in Japan, and, and this also involves uh, children, school children. And, uh, and in the UK, uh, we had there's the Dementia Friends movement, too. And so um, I think uh, to tackle with Dementia problem, uh, we have to reorganize the society for, for them to have a normal life. And uh, I'd like to have some comments from the panelists. Any panelists wants to comment? Dr. Whitehouse. I think the sustainability issue is key. These are long-term issues. I sometimes think of the children in the school not only as children today, but the elders uh, of the future. And as was pointed out by Dr. Alessi, I think we've got to take a perspective on those it, citizens in our society who don't vote yet, which is the problem, but also they're, they're the future elders, and they need to start early thinking about their aging. But that's kind of long-term thinking that I think requires an intergenerational perspective. 
It, it's amazing. It strikes me because I, I, I was uh, near the field of rehabilitation many, many years ago and the WHO with the IFC 10 and the notion of social participation and how, in fact, working on the environment and the social aspect, you can diminish the handicap or increase the social participation. It seems that it's, it's a very uh, similar approach that, uh, and one of the emphasis I've been hearing, in fact, uh, this afternoon, and maybe this is an inspiring source that we should probably, uh, Dr. Saxena, uh, relate with more in the future. I would like to, on, on behalf of uh, Professor Hasegawa, Dr. Hasegawa and myself, uh, thanks uh, all the speakers. I think we heard um, uh, relatively convergent uh, ways of approaching the care and, and, and a very uh, uh, shared importance for care uh, from all the panelists. We heard uh, differences uh, in terms of the approach and I think uh, that uh, as it is the case for the planet, it is important that biodiversity here uh, is present so that we can compare and, and learn from these uh, differences. I hope that the, uh, this global action against dementia and the support of all those stakeholders, including OECD, will allow us to better compare and, and have a better sense of comparison. And, and I think we're, we're at a point where I feel uh, listening to, uh, to, to you speakers, I feel that there's a, a window of opportunity to compare uh, between uh, the different jurisdictions and countries, uh, not only uh, within the G7 group, but uh, probably beyond, including the low and middle, middle uh, income countries where uh, very uh, original ways of approaching dementia is also uh, should, should be a source of learning for all of us. So I would like to thank you all. And um, I think there uh, will be some uh, housekeeping announcement now. Thank you so much. The chairpersons and the panelists, the eight panelists, saying, well, thank you very much for your inputs. Uh, we'd like to have a 30 minute break here. And uh, there will be the coffee services outside. Please enjoy yourselves. At the next session, we'll restart at, uh, with session three, that is the people living in the community, and the session four in the Sky Studio, that is to promote the understanding for the dementia and the promotion of education. It's free seating, so please come back earlier rather than later, and if it's a full house, allow me to turn down some of you. And you can choose either of the breakout sessions the front line, the speakers, the front row will be changed and those who will be presenting uh, in session three will take the front lines. So if you want to leave the venue, please leave the simultaneous interpreting device on the table. Uh, this is part of the membership club, so the corridors and the Lobby Isa, please refrain from eating and drinking. Now I'd like to resume at 3.30.